Every night, the lights in Tokyo flicker and flash in a code that everyone understands. Economic power has shifted from the west to the east. And Tokyo is the capital of a new Pacific age. Amidst the pulsing neon lights, this shift looks like a recent change, a new wave. But Asia's march to power and influence began over 120 years ago with one pivotal story. In 1868, a 16-year-old boy became emperor of Japan. He was called Meiji, and in his name, an isolated island nation became a modern world power. The shock waves would transform the Pacific world. Asia's journey from the rice paddy to the microchip was born of fear. One century ago, Asia's choice was clear. Modernize or be conquered by the Western powers. Before the Meiji era, in the mid-19th century, the decline of China's magnificent civilization haunted East Asia. Consumed by famine and rebellion from within, China was also attacked from without by British gunboats, forcing open the country to Western trade. Scarcely noticed, except by a few Dutch traders, was a small string of islands called Japan. For two centuries, Japan had been locked away from the outside world. By 1615, after a century of civil war, the powerful Lord Tokugawa had defeated his enemies and declared himself shogun, ruler of all Japan. Tokugawa divided society into four ranks. At the bottom were the merchants, then came the artisans. Just above them were the farmers who gave up half their rice harvest to those at the top, the samurai. Only samurai had the right to carry swords. The law of the land set them apart. The Tokugawa shogunate was a kingdom built for war, but it began to crumble after 200 years of peace. It was the most orderly place imaginable. It was a completely schematized society where everybody knew who he was and what he had to do. But in fact, because it was so idealized and so orderly and so tidy, history got away from it. The samurai, who were the elite of the Tokugawa system, had not been allowed to raise its swords for 200 years. And in between had become civil servants, their swords rusting, propped up against their desks while they kept the accounts of their lords. Many of these samurai ceased being able to make a reasonable living, so they went into debt to the merchants. So although the merchants were at the very bottom of the Confucian hierarchy, they began to have more and more power over the samurai who were in their debt. Merchants, once scorned under the Confucian hierarchy, became more powerful as Japan's barter economy gave way to a new money economy. The hustle of merchants turned the world of the samurai upside down. Japan was a society about to explode. The coming of the West struck the spark. In 1853, four American warships steamed up the bay at Uraga, near Edo. Commanded by Commodore Perry, the Americans had come to open up Japan. 
They wanted water and coal for their whaling ships and China trade. The Japanese were astounded at the power of Perry's vessels. They called them black ships for the ominous smoke that billowed from their coal engines. They sent a clear message. If the Japanese didn't open up their country, Perry would open it by force. Most Japanese had never seen a Westerner. In the first portraits of Perry and his men, they marveled at the strange-looking barbarians from across the sea. On shore, Perry showered his hosts with gifts, including a toy steam locomotive which the Japanese studied with fascination. The impact of Perry's visit was extraordinary. All those strange, huge black ships, the strange people, red-faced foreigners, it was as if they came from Mars. And of course, they brought machines with them. The Japanese had never seen technology like this toy train before. They were fascinated. The British, Russians, French, and Dutch quickly followed Perry into Japan. Overrun with strange foreigners, the Shogun government opened the Institute for the Investigation of Barbarian Books. To some, the arrival of the Westerners was a direct attack on the values of traditional Japan. In southwestern Japan, the remote provinces of Satsuma and Choshu were centers of anti-Western thought. Their samurai, called Shishi, or men of high purpose, believed that Japan was sacred ground and that the emperor, now a figurehead in the ancient capital of Kyoto, was a god. The Shishi were furious that the shogun had signed an agreement with the foreign barbarians without the emperor's consent. The initial Japanese response to the West was xenophobic, anti-Western. The great slogan of the time, Son no Joi, of revere the emperor and expel the barbarian. Japan understood as sacred territory and these fools were not to be allowed in regardless of Perry's show of force. And that this was not just talk. Shishi murdered prominent foreigners, a translator for the Americans, a British diplomat. Other Shishi attacked Western ships. The response from the West was immediate and devastating. With modern cannon, they bombarded the home capitals of the Shishi in Satsuma and Choshu. Today, the battlements remain from the walled city of Hagi, the old Choshu capital. And much of the town looks just as it did over a hundred years ago. Here, samurai retreated within their city walls to find a way to expel the hated but well-armed barbarians. It's a story that lives on today in the lessons taught to Hagi schoolchildren how a radical teacher from Choshu found a solution that would change forever the history of Japan, and how his young students went on to become the leaders of a new nation. Today, the teacher is revered in Hagi as one of Japan's great heroes. His name was Yoshida Shoin, at the Hagi Grammar School, first graders recite a saying by Yoshida every day before school. The Yoshida story is legendary. He defied the shogun's orders and rode out to Perry's black ship to learn the secrets of the barbarians. 
For this, he was arrested and exiled to Hagi, where he continued to teach. Because of the efforts of Yoshida Shoin, the country was opened up, and from that point on, foreigners could come and go. Now we have many things that we import from foreign countries, like bread and bananas and pineapples, and they're really delicious. And if we hadn't opened the country up, we'd still just be eating rice all the time. In this small schoolhouse, Yoshida conveyed his key lesson to many of the men who would govern Japan. To drive the barbarians from our shores, we must learn to use their guns. It was the beginning of a new idea and a new slogan. Japanese spirit, Western technology. Yoshida's ideas lived on in the mind of his student, Ito Hirobumi, who went on to become Japan's first prime minister. Yoshida had convinced Ito and others from Satsuma and Shoshu to travel abroad and learn the secrets of Western civilization. These people argued strenuously for reform before you try and confront the barbarians. If you try and confront the barbarians with samurai swords, they have cannon, they'll mow you down. The Japanese visits to the lands of the barbarians were strange for both sides. American tabloids printed caricatures. A Japanese visitor wrote a poem. All is strange, appearance and language. I must be in dreamland. For centuries, it was China that had captured Japan's imagination with a culture that dominated the Pacific. So the Japanese were shocked when they stopped in China on their way home from the West. By the 1860s, the largest port cities were dominated by the Western powers. In Shanghai, Chinese fawned over foreigners and the large French, British, and American firms controlled most of the wealth. The humbling of mighty China propelled the Shishi into action. First, the Satsuma Choshu regions armed themselves, Western style. Then they joined forces to topple the Shogun and take charge of Japan. By the 1860s, as America fought its own war between the states, Japan, too, was plunged into a state of civil war. Terrorists for and against the shogun conducted a campaign of assassinations, robbing the country of many of its most prominent leaders. In 1867, Saigo Takamori led an army of the Satsuma Choshu Alliance and defeated the shogun's army near Kyoto. The Satsuma Choshu armies marched from the old capital, Kyoto, to Edo. They renamed the city Tokyo, or Eastern Capital, and they brought with them the 16-year-old boy emperor. Newly installed in power, the emperor was renamed Meiji, or Enlightened Rule. He became the symbol for a new Japan that would transform itself in 40 years from a country of rice paddies to a modern military and economic power that could stand up to the West. It was the emperor's government, but the governing was really done by a very small group of young samurai. Most of them were in their early 30s and late 20s. An amazing group.